Chapter 13 Two Worshippers Based on Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. Unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, Christ spoke the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee goes up to the temple to worship, not because he feels that he is a sinner in need of pardon, but because he thinks himself righteous and hopes to win commendation. His worship he regards as an act of merit that will recommend him to God. At the same time, it will give the people a high opinion of his piety. He hopes to secure favor with both God and man. His worship is prompted by self-interest. And he is full of self-praise. He looks it, he walks it, he prays it. Drawing apart from others as if to say, Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou, Isaiah 65, verse 5, he stands and prays with himself. Wholly self-satisfied, he thinks that God and men regard him with the same complacency. God, I thank thee, he says, that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. He judges his character not by the holy character of God, but by the character of other men. His mind is turned away from God to humanity. This is the secret of his self-satisfaction. He proceeds to recount his good deeds. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The religion of the Pharisee does not touch the soul. He is not seeking God-likeness of character, a heart filled with love and mercy. He is satisfied with a religion that has to do only with the outward life. His righteousness is his own, the fruit of his own works, and judged by a human standard. Whoever trusts in himself that he is righteous will despise others. As the Pharisee judges himself by other men, so he judges other men by himself. His righteousness is estimated by theirs, and the worse they are, the more righteous by contrast he appears. His self-righteousness leads to accusing. Other men he condemns as transgressors of God's law. Thus he is making manifest the very spirit of Satan, the accuser of the brethren. With this spirit, it is impossible for him to enter into communion with God. He goes down to his house destitute of the divine blessing. The publican had gone to the temple with other worshippers, but he soon drew apart from them as unworthy to unite in their devotions. Standing afar off, he would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast in bitter anguish and self-abhorrence. He felt that he had transgressed against God, and that he was sinful and polluted. He could not expect even pity from those around him, for they looked upon him with contempt. He knew that he had no merit to commend him to God, and in utter self-despair he cried, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He did not compare himself with others. Overwhelmed with a sense of guilt, he stood as if alone in God's presence. His only desire was for pardon and peace. His only plea was the mercy of God, and he was blessed. I tell you, Christ said, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. The Pharisee and the publican represent two great classes into which those who come to worship God are divided. Their first two representatives are found in the first two children that were born into the world. Cain thought himself righteous, and he came to God with a thank-offering only. He made no confession of sin and acknowledged no need of mercy. But Abel came with the blood that pointed to the Lamb of God. He came as a sinner, confessing himself lost. His only hope was the unmerited love of God. The Lord had respect to his offering, but to Cain and his offering, he had not respect. The sense of need, the recognition of our poverty and sin, is the very first condition of acceptance with God. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, verse 3. For each of the classes represented by the Pharisee and the publican, there is a lesson in the history of the Apostle Peter. In his early discipleship, Peter thought himself strong. Like the Pharisee, in his own estimation, he was not as other men are. When Christ, on the eve of his betrayal, forewarned his disciples, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, Peter confidently declared, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Mark fourteen twenty seven and 29. Peter did not know his own danger. Self-confidence misled him. He thought himself able to withstand temptation, but in a few short hours the test came, and with cursing and swearing he denied his Lord. When the crowing of the cock reminded him of the words of Christ, Surprised and shocked at what he had just done, he turned and looked at his master. At that moment, Christ looked at Peter, and beneath that grieved look, in which compassion and love for him were blended, Peter understood himself. He went out and wept bitterly. That look of Christ's broke his heart. Peter had come to the turning point and bitterly did he repent his sin. He was like the publican in his contrition and repentance, and like the publican he found mercy. The look of Christ assured him of pardon. Now his self-confidence was gone. Never again were the old boastful assertions repeated. Christ, after his resurrection, thrice tested Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, he said, lovest thou me more than these? Peter did not now exalt himself above his brethren. He appealed to the one who could read his heart. Lord, he said, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. John 21, 15 and 17. Then he received his commission, a work broader and more delicate than had heretofore been his, was appointed him. Christ bade him feed the sheep and the lambs. In thus committing to his stewardship the souls for whom the Savior had laid down his own life, Christ gave to Peter the strongest proof of confidence in his restoration. The once restless, boastful, self-confident disciple had become subdued and contrite. Henceforth he followed his Lord in self-denial and self-sacrifice. He was a partaker of Christ's sufferings, and when Christ shall sit upon the throne of his glory, Peter will be a partaker in his glory. The evil that led to Peter's fall and that shut out the Pharisee from communion with God is proving the ruin of thousands today. There is nothing so offensive to God or so dangerous to the human soul as pride and self-sufficiency. Of all sins, it is the most hopeless the most incurable. Peter's fall was not instantaneous, but gradual. Self-confidence led him to the belief that he was saved, and step after step was taken in the downward path until he could deny his master. Never can we safely put confidence in self or feel this side of heaven that we are secure against temptation. Those who accept the Savior, however sincere their conversion, should never be taught to say or to feel that they are saved. This is misleading. Everyone should be taught to cherish hope and faith, but even when we give ourselves to Christ and know that He accepts us, we are not beyond the reach of temptation. God's Word declares, Many shall be purified and made white and tried. Daniel 12.10 Only he who endures the trial will receive the crown of life. James 1.12 Those who accept Christ and in their first confidence say, I am saved, are in danger of trusting to themselves. They lose sight of their own weakness and their constant need of divine strength. They are unprepared for Satan's devices and under temptation many, like Peter, fall into the very depths of sin. We are admonished, 
Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Our only safety is in constant distrust of self and dependence on Christ. It was necessary for Peter to learn his own defects of character and his need of the power and grace of Christ. The Lord could not save him from trial, but he could have saved him from defeat. Had Peter been willing to receive Christ's warning, he would have been watching unto prayer. He would have walked with fear and trembling lest his feet should stumble, and he would have received divine help so that Satan could not have gained the victory. It was through self-sufficiency that Peter fell, and it was through repentance and humiliation that his feet were again established. In the record of his experience, every repenting sinner may find encouragement. Though Peter had grievously sinned, he was not forsaken. The words of Christ were written upon his soul, I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. Luke 22.32 In his bitter agony of remorse, this prayer and the memory of Christ's look of love and pity gave him hope. Christ, after his resurrection, remembered Peter and gave the angel the message for the women, Go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth forth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Mark 16, verse 7. Peter's repentance was accepted by the sin-pardoning Savior. And the same compassion that reached out to rescue Peter is extended to every soul who has fallen under temptation. It is Satan's special device to lead man into sin and then leave him helpless and trembling, fearing to seek for pardon. But why should we fear when God has said, Let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Isaiah 27, verse 5. Every provision has been made for our infirmities, every encouragement offered us to come to Christ. Christ offered up his broken body to purchase back God's heritage, to give man another trial. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7.25 By his spotless life, his obedience, his death on the cross of Calvary, Christ interceded for the lost race. And now, not as a mere petitioner does the captain of our salvation intercede for us, but as a conqueror claiming his victory. His offering is complete, and as our intercessor, he executes his self-appointed work, holding before God the censer containing his own spotless merits and the prayers, confessions, and thanksgiving of his people. Perfumed with the fragrance of his righteousness, these ascend to God as a sweet savor. The offering is wholly acceptable, and pardon covers all transgression. Christ has pledged himself to be our substitute and surety, and he neglects no one. He who could not see human beings exposed to eternal ruin without pouring out his soul unto death on their behalf will look with pity and compassion upon every soul who realizes that he cannot save himself. He will look upon no trembling suppliant without raising him up. He who through his own atonement provided for man an infinite fund of moral power will not fail to employ this power in our behalf. We may take our sins and sorrows to his feet, for he loves us. His every look and word invites our confidence. He will shape and mold our characters according to his own will. In the whole satanic force there is not power to overcome one soul who in simple trust casts himself on Christ. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might he increaseth strength. Isaiah 40, verse 29. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Lord says, Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean, 
From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. 1 John 1, 9, Jeremiah 3, 13, and Ezekiel 36, 25. But we must have a knowledge of ourselves, a knowledge that will result in contrition before we can find pardon and peace. The Pharisee felt no conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit could not work with him. His soul was encased in a self-righteous armor, which the arrows of God, barbed and true-aimed by angel hands, failed to penetrate. It is only he who knows himself to be a sinner that Christ can save. He came to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Luke 4.18 But they that are whole need not a physician. Luke 5.31 We must know our real condition, or we shall not feel our need of Christ's help. We must understand our danger, or we shall not flee to the refuge. We must feel the pain of our wounds, or we should not desire healing. The Lord says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Revelation three seventeen and 18. The gold tried in the fire is faith that works by love. Only this can bring us into harmony with God. We may be active, we may do much work, but without love, such love as dwelt in the heart of Christ we can never be numbered with the family of heaven. No man can of himself understand his errors. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The lips may express a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. While speaking to God of poverty of spirit, the heart may be swelling with the conceit of its own superior humility and exalted righteousness. In one way only can a true knowledge of self be obtained. We must behold Christ. It is ignorance of him that makes men so uplifted in their own righteousness. When we contemplate his purity and excellence, we shall see our own weakness and poverty and defects as they really are. We shall see ourselves lost and hopeless, clad in garments of self-righteousness, like every other sinner. We shall see that if we are ever saved, it will not be through our own goodness, but through God's infinite grace. The prayer of the publican was heard because it showed dependence, reaching forth to lay hold on omnipotence. Self to the publican appeared nothing but shame. Thus it must be seen by all who seek God, by faith, faith that renounces all self-trust, the needy suppliant is to lay hold upon infinite power. No outward observances can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. But no man can empty himself of self. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. Then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property, keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. It is not only at the beginning of the Christian life that this renunciation of self is to be made. At every advanced step heavenward, it is to be renewed. All our good works are dependent on a power outside of ourselves. Therefore, there needs to be a continual reaching out to the heart after God, a continual, earnest, heart-breaking confession of sin and humbling of the soul before Him. Only by constant renunciation of self and dependence on Christ can we walk safely. 
The nearer we come to Jesus and the more clearly we discern the purity of his character, the more clearly we shall discern the exceeding sinfulness of sin and the less we shall feel like exalting ourselves. Those whom heaven recognizes as holy ones are the last to parade their own goodness. The Apostle Peter became a faithful minister of Christ, and he was greatly honored with divine light and power. He had an active part in the upbuilding of Christ's church. But Peter never forgot the fearful experience of his humiliation. His sin was forgiven, yet well he knew that for the weakness of character which had caused his fall, only the grace of Christ could avail. He found in himself nothing in which to glory. None of the apostles or prophets ever claimed to be without sin. Men who have lived nearest to God, men who would sacrifice life itself rather than knowingly commit a wrong act, men whom God had honored with divine light and power, have confessed the sinfulness of their own nature. They have put no confidence in the flesh, have claimed no righteousness of their own, but have trusted wholly in the righteousness of Christ. So will it be with all who behold Christ. At every advanced step in Christian experience, our repentance will deepen. It is to those whom the Lord has forgiven, to those whom he acknowledges as his people, that he says, Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight. Ezekiel 36.31 Again he says, I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that thou mayest remember and be confounded, and never open thy mouth any more because of thy shame, when I am pacified toward thee, for all that thou hast done, saith the Lord God. Ezekiel 16, 62 and 63. Then our lips will not be opened in self-glorification. We shall know that our sufficiency is in Christ alone. We shall make the apostles' confession our own. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Romans 7, 18. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Galatians 6.14 In harmony with this experience is the command, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2.12 and 13 God does not bid you fear that he will fail to fulfill his promises that his patience will weary, or his compassion be found wanting. Fear lest your will shall not be held in subjection to Christ's will, lest your hereditary and cultivated traits of character shall control your life. It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Fear lest self shall interpose between your soul and the great master worker. Fear lest self-will shall mar the high purpose that through you God desires to accomplish. Fear to trust to your own strength. Fear to withdraw your hand from the hand of Christ and attempt to walk life's pathway without his abiding presence. We need to shun everything that would encourage pride and self-sufficiency. Therefore, we should beware of giving or receiving flattery or praise. It is Satan's work to flatter. He deals in flattery as well as in accusing and condemnation. Thus he seeks to work the ruin of the soul. Those who give praise to men are used by Satan as his agents. Let the workers for Christ direct every word of praise away from themselves. Let self be put out of sight. Christ alone is to be exalted. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, let every eye be directed, and praise from every heart ascend. Revelation 1.5 The life in which the fear of the Lord is cherished will not be a life of sadness and gloom. It is the absence of Christ that makes the countenance sad, and the life a pilgrimage of sighs. Those who are filled with self-esteem and self-love 
do not feel the need of a living personal union with Christ. The heart that has not fallen on the rock is proud of its wholeness. Men want a dignified religion. They desire to walk in a path wide enough to take in their own attributes. Their self-love, their love of popularity and love of praise exclude the Savior from their hearts, and without Him there is gloom and sadness. But Christ dwelling in the soul is a wellspring of joy. For all who receive Him, the very keynote of the Word of God is rejoicing. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Isaiah fifty seven fifteen. It was when Moses was hidden in the cleft of the rock that he beheld the glory of God. It is when we hide in the riven rock that Christ will cover us with his own pierced hand, and we shall hear what the Lord saith unto his servants. To us as to Moses, God will reveal himself as merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Ezekiel 34, 6 and 7. The work of redemption involves consequences of which it is difficult for man to have any conception. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. As the sinner drawn by the power of Christ approaches the uplifted cross and prostrates himself before it, there is a new creation. A new heart is given him. He becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus. Holiness finds that it has nothing more to require. God himself is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus, Romans 3.26, and whom he justified, them he also glorified, Romans 8, verse 30. Great as is the shame and degradation through sin, even greater will be the honor and exaltation through redeeming love. To human beings striving for conformity to the divine image, there is imparted an outlay of heaven's treasure, an excellency of power that will place them higher than even the angels who have never fallen. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth. Kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. Isaiah 49, verse 7. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted.